So thank you all for peeling yourselves out of uh, perfectly warm beds to uh, come hear about this. It is a topic near and dear to my heart, and it's a follow-on, as many of my talks are, it's a follow-on to things that I've said before. So I was in Reno, and I talked a little bit about some of this stuff, but you know, the game keeps moving and, uh, and yet it's the same players with the same goals. So this is kind of a mid span update as all of them will be. And, um, what it amounts to just, you know, the, uh, give away the, the punchline is that to the extent that we are torturing malware to find out what it does, uh, that's about to become a whole lot less useful. And to the extent that we are using firewalls or network traces to find out sort of what all of the internet of things uh, is doing inside of our homes, uh, that is about to become a whole lot less useful. And for that matter, uh, having a firewall in any form is about to become much harder. This is deliberate, but we are not the targets. Let me explain. a long abstract here. Um, I could have just printed that, handed it all to you, and we could be drinking coffee. So um, we are already in a situation where the network of networks that uh, was the original concept for the internet has kind of gone away. And the idea that we each have a network that we pay for, that uh, we then connect to something that then causes the aggregate of all those connected networks to be able to reach various parts of each other and creates this, this huge global thing that we all, uh, I guess, love. Um, that has kind of, um, we've gone all the way around. We've gone a full lap around the track. And the idea that we're gonna build a network for us that has resources that we care about, like file servers or whatever, uh, and that we're going to be very careful about who can connect to those. Uh, and we will also have desktops, Wi-Fi, that kind of thing. Um, but that our network will be separately useful than the internet, the network of networks. That's kind of gone. Um, we are all treated as, yeah, thank you for adding more connectivity for the rest of the world to be accessed from. But, you know, in general, uh, we can't get a darn thing done if we don't have an internet connection because there's nothing useful on our side of our gateway. Um, that's not the way this thing started, right? There, there were networks that were not connected to the internet that were nevertheless useful as recently as 1995. I know that seems like a long time ago, but I was there and it does not seem so long to me. Anyway, what this means is if you want effective security, you're gonna to have to go back in time. Uh, if you're gonna have a modern network, you're probably not gonna have very much uh, security. And you know, we're already in the, the mode where we have uh, no hope of really examining something that we bought. You know, if you have a smart TV, for example, and you plug it in, uh, you can't really evaluate the source code or even look at reports written by people who have. Um, you, you don't know what vendors you're trusting. You don't know what their supply chain is. In fact, if anything, you know that the maker of your smart TV doesn't know what their supply chain is. And so, you know, something like shell shock will come along and you have no idea if your refrigerator is vulnerable or not, nor does the company who makes it. And so what we're doing now uh, is watching the network to get some sense of whether bad things are happening. We can no longer do anything by looking at an endpoint. Uh, we're looking at a user, right? Uh, as we know, users could be the good kind that we are there to serve, but they could also be malicious insiders. Uh, they could be intruders. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of users that we don't want to provide services to. And, you know, there are a lot of folks out there, if you look at the Beyond Corp zero trust model, they'll say firewalls aren't helping you. You need to secure every endpoint to make sure that it's somebody's credentials rather than their IP address that is what gives them access to your stuff. And that's not entirely wrong, uh, just mostly wrong, because I can't secure my endpoints. 
you know, uh, I have a friend who works at Google and they make a thing called a Chromecast and that's used to make a lot of TVs smart. Um, and so I simply asked the question, would you be willing to uh, swap out your Chromecast for a cheaper Chinese made equivalent of the Chromecast and put all of your conference rooms in the hands of such a vendor? And I will no, we would never do that. Well, that's what you're asking us to do with your Chromecast. How come you're not willing to do it? Well, we're big, you're small, Mike makes right, et cetera. Um, so anyway, it's behavior. It's what they do. And what that means is uh, network behavior, packets and flows coming from devices. Uh, that's how we decide whether a device is good or evil. That's how we decide whether a user is good or evil, by what it does, because that's what we can still see. And, um, you know, when you think about breaking rules, which, you know, a lot of us break rules. I've gotten a couple of uh, speeding tickets in my life. Um, you'd like to know which rule you're breaking. Um, but on the Internet, you know, you're not going to, going to observe every rule in the universe just because you might send packets there. You'll be worried about the rules where you are. Your attacker is not worried about the rules where you are or the laws. And what that means is that behavioral security is not a good thing. It is not a goal that we sought. It was a refuge that we sought because nothing else was working and we still had to secure what we could, how we could. And so we were doing this thing that's pretty cheesy and pretty ineffective. And um, what I worry about, and the reason I keep getting on airplanes and coming to talk to folks is that it's going away. And I don't know what the last refuge is going to be after this one goes away. But I want everybody to be thinking about this. It's amazing how much change is in the air and it's coming right at us that nobody who is outside the IETF is even aware of. And there's a little bit of a big lie problem here. Um, the truth is so outrageous that uh, a lot of People, when they hear somebody say, yeah, the IETF is doing this, that, and the other thing, are you crazy? There's no way they could be doing that. You, this must, you're, you're joking. No, I'm not joking. So you have to find a way to put some credibility in front of my words here, even though they sound insane. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Now, to review how we got here, um, it was complexity. Um, that's it. We, can't, we keep adding more stuff, more transistors to our chips, more chips to our designs, uh, more suppliers for those chips. Um, it's now at the point where, uh, you know, if you want to build military hardware for military purposes, the military has its own fab because they can't just go buy a memory chip from somebody because they have no idea what other circuits will be on the particular box of chips that they got. Um, that's, I think, one of the big reasons why Apple has its own fabs. Now, they don't make every chip that they that they make, but the ones that are important, Apple makes. They don't buy those. Because if you're buying a chip, yeah, a lot of things get sort of swapped around. You know, same uh, chip, the same, uh, same pinout, the same capabilities or whatever is sold by a lot of different companies under different names. You visit a book somewhere, you find the equivalent, you buy the cheapest one. Yeah, that cheapest one could easily have a an extra 16-bit microprocessor hiding under one of the vias. Things are small. Um, and that's just hardware. Think about software. Yeah, you know, you've got whatever the BIOS is that came with whatever uh, CPU chip you have. You know, you've got an extra 32-bit sort of 386-class CPU in every modern 64-bit Intel uh, or AMD chip that you buy. And that's got a version of Linux that was old enough that uh, we were still using floppy disks uh, when, when it was crafted, right? Because Intel does not say, gee, let's, let's track all the, all the bugs. Let's tra track all the fixes and just keep shipping whatever is, is working. So as we add all this stuff, it means that the combinations and permutations of all the different state variables in the distributed system are unbounded. Um, nobody knows everything, like nobody knows enough. Uh, very few people know very much at all, and you're in this room. Uh, but most people who are doing this have no hope of understanding, yeah, you bought a smart TV, that's fine. Don't put it on your network, right? Connect it to 
a, even a Chromecast for crying out loud or a fire stick, which is I, I work at Amazon now. Uh, you would be safer with that than with a TV whose software is of unknown origins. You're not going to get the average person walking into an electronics store to understand those risks or to take seriously what you could say if you could reach them. So what we have is just this amazing increase in complexity. That is why site security is kind of impossible in the modern world. So, you know, doing this right is expensive. Uh, and the people who know what doing it right means are expensive and probably hard to get along with uh, because they've been under stress for a long time. Um, and it, it, what this comes out to is that you, you, you don't even take this seriously anymore. You know you're breached. You, you, you don't know exactly by whom or how many times or since when, but you assume that you are breached. And you know, a few years ago, the Office of Personnel Management, who was responsible for uh, security clearances for pretty much the federal government of this country, uh, was breached and they knew it and they couldn't do anything about it. They continued to operate for an additional five months after they learned about it because the alternative would be to shut down the method by which security clearances are created until we could sort of rebuild it all from known good software, which by the way, known good software is a little hard to, hard to come by. Um, so yeah, there were uh, attackers from China that were in that network for at least five months that we know about, and they knew it and they had to continue operating. That's how complicated things are. Literally, only our attackers truly understand what we are running on our networks and our servers. Um, we ought to worry about that. Um, some of us do, and we ought to take some action, and most of you are. But again, this is, the, this is how things got as bad as they are, uh, after telling you how bad they are. Um, I do want to remind us that to attack someone means that you are at risk of profit. If you attack them successfully, you might get information you could sell or whatever. Uh, to defend, you are only at risk of uh, cost. So uh, the incentive structure is wildly different between those of us who are trying to get some assurance about our information uh, versus those of us, uh, the, none of us, the, those of them who are trying to reduce that assurance. Um, that has always been the case. It probably will always be the case. I can't imagine any of us are going to get an incentive contract somewhere where we get paid more if we are unsuccessfully attacked. Um, so short of that, uh, the, these are the, the conditions. This is what will be uh, true going forward. So the last 10 years or so has been interesting. Um, in 2013, there was a lot of news stories about a, a contractor for the NSA who uh, made some disclosures. He flew to Hong Kong. He said, look, I stole all this stuff from the government, and uh, here's what it is, and this is what it means, and I'm angry about it, and you should be too. I'm an activist, um, et cetera. And, uh, as far as I know, he is still in Russia living uh, I don't know what he does for a living, but you know he's, he's uh, in the Moscow area uh, because that's where he is safe from extradition by this country. So not everybody thinks that this guy was a hero, um, but the IETF responded in a positive way. They said, thank you for these disclosures. Uh, we are 20-somethings. We had no idea how the world worked. We didn't know that this kind of dirty tricks is what every government has always done throughout history. Uh, we, the 20 somethings of the IETF at that time, are outraged that any part of the world has ever worked this way and we're gonna put a stop to it. And, um, and they are, that's why I'm here. There are two RFCs, that's a request for comments, that is an internet standards document. Uh, one is 7258, which explains that pervasive monitoring is an attack and that we have to resist that attack. And 8890 was written by the Internet Activities Board. That's kind of as high as you can go in the legislature there, uh, where it simply said, the Internet is for the end users. 
uh, bypassing the fact that some of us who pay to build our portions of the internet might not even have users, might just be sensors. Or we might really want to serve some users, but not others, not the intruders, not the malicious insiders. And that we, the operators of these secure private networks at the edge, need the tools by which we can determine which users we wish to serve and which ones we do not. Um, none, of, none of that matters. Uh, we are the baby and uh, the NSA disclosures are the bathwater and we are going out with that with them. Um, again, I, I encourage you to study these, read these, uh, comment on these, get involved here. It is the fact that the people in this room by and large have more important things to do that has allowed such progress to be made in such a horrible direction. Um, we need more voices who can say, wait, wait, I'm trying to secure something. I won't be able to do that anymore uh, if this particular feature gets added to this particular protocol. That voice is absent. Uh, I'm aware of these meetings, but there are too many of them for me. I mean, even if I if I had no other thing to do in life, I could not be everywhere I need to be. So I need you guys read these things, find out where they came from, go there, be part of the next next round of discussions. Um, oh, I should mention that surveillance capitalism uh, is alive and well, still driving the digital economy and benefits obscenely from the changes the IETF is making that make it, make it harder for the NSA to do the sorts of pervasive monitoring the NSA is doing, right? Uh, Comcast famously sued Google during the uh, first year of the DNS over HTTP struggle. And in their lawsuit, Comcast said, and you know, this is something everybody knew, and I thought it was pretty bold for Comcast to be willing to say it in, you know, in a court document. They said is Google and Comcast are both in the advertising business. We compete and we both need to see what users are doing. And uh, Google is acting in an anti-competitive way by encrypting the DNS traffic that is coming from Comcast's customers so that only Google for 8.8.8.8 will know what those questions were. And we, Comcast, since we no longer know what those questions were, will be at a disadvantage when it comes to selling ads to our own customers. Wow. Everybody knew that was happening, but that's pretty bold. Because, um, yes, ISPs are in a thin margin environment. They have got to do every little thing they can. And anything you don't encrypt will be used against you uh, in, by the surveillance capitalists of the world. Uh, and... This stuff that I'm describing today plays right into that particular game because uh, there are plenty of companies out there who either run DNS servers or they have browsers or they have clouds or they have all three. Uh, and they'll be very happy if no one in between their smartphone and their service can tell what is happening there because then they will be the only ones who are aware of the activity of that class of users. And you know, I remind you, this is the information age, and information uh, power is greater than all other powers, right? If you're going to uh, impose terms on someone, uh, information is better than kinetics. You will do better with surveillance capitalism than you would do with bombs in the long run, right? Obviously, uh, as we see in Ukraine right now, bombs are very powerful in the short term. But it's only if you know sort of uh, who you're bombing and uh, what their options are. And if you can constrain those options, that's when the long term advantage comes. And so you have to dominate in the in information sphere. This is how that is playing out. Everybody knows they got to dominate in the information sphere. And a lot of people don't want to be dominated or they don't want the NSA to be able to dominate. And they're kind of doing the wrong thing. Now, uh, the Internet beat OSI. Uh, stuff like X.400 and X.500 and X.29 and all the other ITU protocols that were about to take over the world when the internet woke up and said, wait, we don't want that. So all these internet-based protocols, uh, they got to market quickly because they were more or less thrown over the wall. 
Uh, they, they were uh, minimum viable protocols, although we didn't have that terminology at that time. And they got uh, shipped in open source software to everybody who wanted that. And so we simply outgrew the competition. But that simplicity, although it helped us get to market uh, first, is not serving us very well now. In particular, if you think about email, a lot of spam goes on there, a lot of uh, unwanted traffic of various kinds. Um, it used to be that there was just one port that you would reach an SMTP server on. It would be port 25. And now there are several, some that are encrypted. And uh, there's one, uh, the submission port 465, uh, which is um, it's treated differently. And the expectation is you're going to have a firewall so that only your internal users can reach the submission server. Um, and the submission server demands authentication. You have to send it a, some kind of a login password or SAML or OAuth or something, or it won't let you send email. They could not impose that authentication constraint on port 25 because it was getting traffic from the whole rest of the internet and they, the, the rest of the internet was not going to know what password to use. So we had to split the system so that the server to server traffic was on one port using one set of protocol options. And then the user to server was on a different port with a different kind of protocol options. Everything needs that. Every single protocol we speak has to, has to bifurcate in that way. We need that for the web. We need that for DNS. We need that for protocol of your choice. Otherwise, we're going to continue to get DDoSed by DNS or NTP servers that are accessible to the world because they have to be and are willing to answer every question that they receive because they have to do. Um, but if you start to say that, then it starts to look as though the network that is at the edge of the Internet, you know, the Internet is a network of networks, it starts to look as though the network has a place in the world and that the user is not what it's all about. In other words, RFC 8890 would say the network is just a conduit uh, and you should not treat users differently. Uh, okay, well, if I can't treat them differently, then I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a harsh life. Now, one of the other things that, um, that made things harder to fix was uh, the lack of uh, seriousness. Right. Uh, NAT was invented outside the IETF. And as you know, most homes and many businesses are using NAT. Uh, but at first, the first five years that that was happening, the Internet Activities Board said that the Internet is an end-to-end -end device. NAT is not an end-to-end -end technology and has no place here. And they actually denied the ability to even publish an RFC explaining how NAT worked. It was something the world had to figure out for, for itself. And the same is largely true of uh, application layer gateways, which you can think of as a reverse proxy. Um, that's the, 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 ar the architecture of this thing did not admit to the existence of firewalls or any of the other stuff that we actually had to have in order to build the thing that then won in the marketplace over OSI. So in fact, the simplicity was a lie. So not only does it not serve us well now, it never really existed. It was just words that were spoken. Now, you know, I'm, uh, I'm obviously complaining about this. I don't like it. Uh, it makes things harder. But I have to admit that there was no other way to get here than this. If we had had to have a plan before we could build, OSI would have won because they had a plan before we could have had a plan. So we are here. It's uncomfortable. There was no other way to get here. It would be worse if we were not here. So, hell. So if you're going to defend now, you are going to break rules doing it. There, there are not a bunch of things in the Internet Protocol Suite that says, yeah, defenders can, can do this here, and that'll help in the following ways. Uh, generally speaking, if you want to do something, you're going to be breaking the purity of the internet architecture to do so. Firewalls would be an example. Um, but monitoring is also an example. I like to know what is going out of my network in case it is like the source code to the product. You could imagine that when Microsoft was in the process of losing a copy of the Windows source code that they would have liked to know 
what the payloads of all those packets were, but they can't because uh, that's been shrouded for a long time. But what was not shrouded at that time, but what's about to be, is information about where those packets are going. I'll explain that in a moment. But let me give a little bit of credit to the people who are building all of this uh, stuff that makes it impossible to see what's going on with your own network. Uh, they're not bad guys or bad people. They are uh, they're technically excellent, and their heart is in the right place, and they're angry about the right things, and they should be doing something. Their passion happens to be misplaced in this case, but that does not mean they are not our fellow travelers. What they're doing is uh, maximizing signal entropy, uh, and I don't want to get into a long discussion of uh, everything Shannon talked about in terms of, of entropy, but uh, just realize that if you transform some information, for example, by compressing it or encrypting it, uh, you are increasing the number of permutations of microstates, which could have given rise to that macrostate. The macrostate is the output of encryption or compression or something like that. And, um, you know, with low entropy, the number of things that could have given rise to this encrypted blob is so small that you can guess what it was. With high entropy, not so. And there is a theoretical maximum of that type of information entropy. And the people who are doing this, which were 20-somethings in, in the, the, the 10 years ago, they're 30-somethings now, uh, understand all of this. Um, this, is, this, uh, uh, this is old hat to them. Um, so the first place we saw this was DNS over HTTP. And the italics are mine. Uh, the RFC that describes it claims that we want to prevent on-path devices from interfering with DNS operations. Well, guess what my firewall is? It's an on-path device. Guess what it does? It interferes with DNS operations. Um, I pointed this out to them because I thought, gee, this is absurd. Do you realize what you're saying? And they said, we know exactly what we're saying. And they just said, you know, Paul, of the, the 90s called, they want your firewall back. Hmm. Okay, well, you can have my firewall when you pry it out of my cold, dead hands, because there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, people can't believe that there are bad people in the world trying to do bad things who aren't the NSA, right? It just, it doesn't occur to them that there are also criminals. So I tried to get a change made to the RFC that this was quoted from. Uh, Quick is a UDP-based replacement for TCP IP. And it's already in your browser. No matter what open source browser you're using, it has this ability in it in some prototype form. And this is the way the world is going. Um, there, we're going to uh, replace TCP, which you can see what's happening with something in UDP that you cannot see what is happening. And so there is a manageability draft trying to explain, well, if you're a network manager, this is how you manage this type of traffic. And it's like 34 pages of no. <laughs> and this sentence just called out to me, screamed out to me in, in pain, in agony. And I said, I think what you mean is that the quick wire image, that's what TCP would show, the quick wire image is specifically designed to be indistinguishable from other UDP traffic. Right, that's what RFC 7258 and RFC 8890 told you to do. Why will you not admit that that is what you're doing and that is why you're doing it? And there was an interminable discussion on a mailing list that I would have to stay awake 26 hours a day to follow. And the ultimate decision was that the sentence will stand as written. So we're not seeing quite as much, uh, I don't know, uh, boldness as I'd like to see. I'd like people to admit what they're doing and that they're having an impact on manageability and it's not an accident. This makes it sound like it's an accident that your network is now impossible to manage. It's not an accident, but I can't find somebody who wants to be an owner of that. So here is a TCP dump showing the first two packets of an SSH session. I apologize for the IPv6 gibberish. Um, it's just what I got. And there are some things that you can see here that are important. In particular, you look at that flags. 
On the first packet, the flag is an S in brackets. That's a sin. And on the second packet, the flags is an S dot in brackets. That is a sin ack. Okay, so you never see sin and ack together except in this one case. And you never see sin by itself except in this one case. And what that means is that a lot of us for the last 30 years have been creating stateless firewalls. That means the firewall doesn't have to remember what's going on. It just looks at each packet, makes a decision, and then forgets all about that decision. And stateless is where you want to be. If Because if you're trying to hold state on every open TCP session on your network, your firewall is going to run out of CPU, it's going to run out of RAM, it's going to generate too much heat, or it's going to get attacked on that basis. Somebody will say, ah, it becomes fragile if you give it too much state to hold. I think they'll give it too much state to hold. You do not want a stateful firewall. You should go home and find out if you have one, because if you do, you should worry about it. Anyway, what you can do here is to simply say, uh, if the SIN bit is set, if it's TCP and the SIN flag is set, uh, and it's outbound, coming from my network, going through my gateway to the world, that's a good thing. And it should go, go forward. And then you don't need to remember anything else. If the same thing tries to happen coming inward, ah, we have rules. It has to be on this port number or this set of port numbers going to this particular server, because that's my email server. And I want it to be able to receive this type of SIN packet from the rest of the world, because without this SIN packet, TCP can't start up. But again, it's stateless. Once you've made your decision, pass or fail, you're done. Okay, so everything that you see is hidden in QUIC. Well, I guess not the IP addresses and the port numbers, but everything else in QUIC, which will replace TCP, is replacing TCP as we sit here. It's all going to be gone. You will not know that this packet is an attempt to create a new session or a new flow. Now, you might be able to make some decisions and say, well, it's a new flow. I'm going to do flow accounting. I'm going to have state on my flows. And it's a new flow that was initiated from the inside, so that's okay, but that won't work. Uh, talk to me afterward if you want to know why it won't work. Um, so all of this stuff that we use, and sometimes I just want to know what the window size was so that I can debug like a path MTU discovery bug that is on some Microsoft server, latest, greatest, patch level, they broke something. I need to see what it is seeing so that I can determine whether what it is doing is correct. Well, me seeing that is not a priority for the uh, post Snowden generation. So let's talk a little bit about transport layer security. This is what makes everything secure for HTTPS, SMTPS, and so on. There was an older standard called SSL, but it's uh, phased out. If you're still using it, you should turn it off. Um, but uh, TLS 1.2 is what almost everything uses. And by the way, if you want to get less spam, just turn off TLS 1.1 and 1.0 and all SSL. Turns out spammers and the botnets they relay through don't update their software very often. They, won't, they don't speak TLS 1.2. So this is a huge, huge difference maker. Um, anyway, um, it's possible if you run a next generation firewall, to be able to have a policy that says, all right, I see that there is a uh, uh, SSL session that is starting up from, you know, is initiated inside the network. So it's somebody's laptop and it's going outside the network. I need to know where that's going. Well, you, you're in luck because that data is not encrypted. That is part of the TLS headers in 1.2. It's part of what's called the client hello. And so you could have a rule that says, you know, if where you're going is pornhub.com, then we're going to disallow it. And if where you're going is, you know, whatever, uh, not on the, the deny list, or it is on the allow list, depending on, on, on philosophy, you can make a decision. Um, your ability to make that decision corresponds to an ability for NSA to be able to pervasively monitor. So that, uh, that ability is going away. Uh, baby plus bathwater. Um, all they're doing is encrypting the client hello um, because they have enough state in TLS at this stage of the conversation that they didn't need that to be in clear text. No one can remember why it was in clear text. But what this in turn means is that your next generation firewall is no longer going to be able to make a policy decision 
about allowing a TLS session to start up based on where it's going. And I think we all know that uh, whether it's Cloudflare or Amazon or whatever, uh, there are a lot of um, CDNs in the world and they have a small number of IP addresses and a very large number, like in the tens or hundreds of millions of different things that they can answer for. And what they need to see is the host keyword in HTTPS, uh, but they're not going to be able to even start up the encryption if they don't know which service you are trying to, to reach. Because it could be www.foo.com or www.bar.com. They both use the same IP address. So this was a way to let the encryption library on the far end know who you were attempting to talk to so it knew which key to answer. Okay, well, that's going away because it was misused by the National Security Administration agency. Um, this is going to be a problem. Um, I'm told by my friends in the UK that uh, if somebody wants to use company equipment, you know, laptop, network, et cetera, to, re to do their banking from their desk, like during a break, uh, that is not only permitted and required to be permitted and supported by the company, it is illegal to surveil it. And so you've already got companies in the UK who are trying to decide whether or not to do deep packet inspection or record things based on whether this is a bank. Uh, because they don't want to be in trouble with their regulator. I don't blame them. I don't want to be in trouble with the regulator either, but this, that will not be possible. You won't know when that employee is talking to their bank and when that employee is uh, thinking about changing jobs and going to your competitor and bringing a lot of intellectual property with them. Now, obviously that employee would be foolish to do that from their company desktop, but it will now work. So um, go us. Um, so we don't have good choices. Uh, we've been put in a bad position and we were not the target of this. We just happened to be going where the rest of the uh, authoritarians of the world are going, right? I am an authoritarian when it comes to my managed private network. If it's my company's network that I am paying for, um, I got to answer to my shareholders about what I'm doing with their money. Uh, that means it's my network and I need to be able to make decisions about what it does. Same thing if I'm at home and I want to deny certain things from working because whatever, the kid hasn't done his homework and we need to need to break the, that video game for a while. I need to be able to do that. It's my network. But that sort of freedom is, I guess, the wrong kind of freedom because, uh, you know, when I mentioned TLS and encrypted client hello, when that spec was announced uh, two years ago, there was a press release. Uh, no, it's a bunch of press stories corresponding to the Russian government saying, yeah, the, the TLS 1.3 thing you want to do with the encrypted client, although we're going to break that. We're going to, we're going to stop that traffic at the border of Russia because anything the, that the Russian government cannot monitor is probably illegal. That's the way we do things here. So we're not going to let a bunch of plucky 20-somethings in Silicon Valley tell us how we're going to run the Russian economy. And should I mention that China did not have a similar press release, but encrypted client hello also does not work through the, uh, the Great Firewall of China. So there's going to be a fallback, right? All these different smartphones and so forth, maybe they'll have a pop-up. They'll say, yeah, you, you live in a bad place. You should move. I am not going to back off and use TCP and whatever. Uh, because you should not have to live this way. There might be some like that, but those companies will not prosper. The companies that prosper will say, oh, well, that didn't work. Let's try the old thing. Ah, that works fine. So we have an option. We can simply force the fallback. It'll be a little bit of a performance problem for us, but we can do that. We can simply break. Uh, I don't allow UDP through my gateways unless it is on a well-known port going to a well-known place. Uh, because I've been worried about people doing things like this. Um, and, you know, people have built full transport layers on like the NTP port or the DNS port before. So, I'm, you know, I've, I've been worried about this for a long time. So I can tell you blocking all UDP 
is only a problem if you play video games and you can find what net blocks to permit in order to allow video games to, to, to work. So that's one thing you can do, force the fallback. Um, there will be some companies or some whatever government networks uh, who will go further. They won't just force a fallback, they will force the use of a proxy. They'll say, okay, we used to just let you talk outside and we'd inspect it and decide whether to break the connection, whatever. That isn't working anymore. The IETF has taken that off the table. So now you need to set a proxy in your laptop or your wristwatch or whatever it is. So if you want to get through the gateway, you're going to have to talk to the gateway using a key that you have to trust. It is going to strip search all of your data as clear text before then regenerating the session toward the outside world. Because frankly, that will be, although very painful, it will be the least cost option remaining. I don't know why people, the, the people who write this stuff don't realize that if we have choices, we're gonna be rational about how, how we make them. So um, there's, there's nothing easy here. Whatever you do next, is gonna be painful. Living with it, painful. Doing something about it, variously painful, depending on how much you intend to do. Um, there is no non-painful option for you. Now there is something that could have been done differently, uh, which is to just say, you know, the network is the thing. And the internet is a network of networks, not a network of human eyeballs meant to sell ads to them. Let's let every network have its own policy. And if the policy is you can't do that, then the user will know they're on a bad network. You know, that's why I don't try to get work done when I'm in China. And now I can't get work done by going to Hong Kong on the weekends either, because they've, they've, uh, they've started doing the bad thing there as well. And that hurts the Chinese economy, but that's up to them to do. It's, you know, they have data sovereignty. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody telling me what I have to do with my network. I'm not going to tell China what they have to do with theirs. Um, but anyway, uh, the idea would be uh, negotiate. Because if you negotiate and you, let's say the endpoint agrees to do certain things and then doesn't do them, then the CISO knows to come after that endpoint with a fire ax. If on the other hand, they negotiate and they just refuse to participate, I don't like the terms that you're offering me, then that's fine, no harm, no foul. But the 20 somethings who came up with all of this in the post Snowden era are in no mood to negotiate. Now, this has some effects on what we do. Some of us in this room uh, have been known to try to reverse engineer some malware. And one of the ways that we do that is we stick it in a VM and fight the battle of trying to keep the malware from being able to detect that it's in a VM and eventually figure out what it tries to connect to and what it tries to say to those places. And, you know, maybe it will have been encrypted, but, you know, once you know it's doing that, you can sort of single step it and find out what was in that buffer before we increased its entropy with the encryption library. Um, that is not going to be possible anymore. You're not going to be able to figure out what a piece of malware is doing by watching the packet traces. And if you could, it wouldn't help you because all, all you would know is uh, what a very high energy expenditure on your part would reveal about that. But that will not give you a signature that you can put into your firewall and say, hey, if you see this, it's the bad thing, stop it. So even if you knew what, if you could tell what it is, which you're designed not to be able to do, you wouldn't be able to use it for anything. But there's a bright side, which is um, if you block this, then the malware that does make it into your network, and there will be some always, um, is going to think that it's running in a VM because quick isn't working. And so, you know, that malware has rights and it will insist on the right to not be uh, surveilled. No on path interference in that malware's activities. And so if you deny it the ability to bypass that with Quick, it will not fall back to TCP. So the whole malware universe is about to tune itself for an environment that you can artificially avoid. So if you decide you're gonna avoid this for perfectly other reasons, uh, you will get this benefit. So um, the M5 computer in this episode of the original Star Trek 
has just vaporized a crewman who is trying to fix a power conduit and has just created a uh, direct connection uh, to the ship's uh, energy core because it's an endpoint and it did not like being threatened about what it could and could not do. And I, I have not found a better way to explain what's happening with QUIC and TLS 1.3 with ECH and DOH than this. Our endpoints have demands. And perhaps you have questions. His hand went up first. So something didn't have the courage to kind of make it clear. Is it courage or is it they're trying to obfuscate? They don't want the clarity. Clarity is the enemy. It doesn't seem to me that it's possible that it's sort of a collusion. I don't think it's collusion. And, you know, we are warned, and rightly so, not to psychologize others. You don't know what their motives are, but I do and I have. And I believe that um, the absurdity needs to be one step back from the front line. Um, you, you can't, I mean, uh, where they've said uh, in the DOH RFC, but they're trying to prevent uh, on-path interference with DNS operations. Uh, that's been widely quoted. That's been made fun of. And I think that the quick people saw that and they just don't want to have the spotlight on them. And they're in no mood to negotiate. So being a reliable negotiating partner is not a priority. You, sir. Um, what about the client side about proxy like Fiddler or, or per proxy for doing malware analysis? Is that all going to be dead with Quick too? Or? No. Um, some of those things uh, do what I was talking about, which is single stepping the malware inside the VM so that you get a chance to see what the clear text was before it was encrypted. Right. So to, to the extent that we already have the ability to see what is about or it, if we watch it with TCP dump, it is incomprehensible TLS 1.2 with whatever crypto and so forth. So we already had to go into the endpoint and say, I want to know what that was before you encrypted it. Um, that's already possible, and it will remain possible, but in a narrow sense. Uh, you consider, for example, that TLS is moving into the kernel. Uh, modern Linux and FreeBSD servers have been enhanced by Netflix, who needed to send a lot of movies to a lot of places, and they couldn't just mmap a file and use a single system call to transmit that file, so they had to teach the kernel how to do encryption in the kernel. And so to the extent that Windows will eventually follow and Mac OS will eventually follow, your ability to find the unencrypted data uh, is gonna be made more difficult. Um, and you know, if you think about how amazingly obfuscated the Conficker malware was back in 2008, 2009, um, they were doing scatter gather so that the entire unencrypted buffer was never in one place. Um, and so you could still do it, but it took hours of human blood, sweat, and tears. There was no way to say, hey, AI, go find the unencrypted data. So it'll always be possible to do that to the extent that you can. But if it is a Nest thermostat <clears throat> with a um, uh, some kind of a supply chain poisoning that Google or whoever owns Nest now uh, is unaware of, uh, I think it'll be a challenge to get that software into a simulator where you can do that thing. So really, we have kind of been pushed into the middle where we're looking at the packets. And uh, sometimes the, the encrypted or the unencrypted client hello, that server name indicator, was all we needed to say, ah, it's doing the bad thing. Nothing should ever connect to whatever that is. I'm not going to permit it. Well, uh, or I'm going to use that as a hint that that particular thing needs to come off the wall and go into the test lab. So, um, no, uh, it will not completely disappear. It will effectively disappear. Most of us don't have the budget in dollars or people to be able to follow where it is going next. Sure. Um, like the newer thing also, um, 
mesh networks and some of the things that you want. But if those protocols um, are to use known ports that you are able to block, and you have any thoughts about this or Sure. Um, a new device coming into this environment that is a new class of device, like whatever, uh, internet connected uh, Cuisinart, um, is going to be speaking six low pan or you know, some other variety of really simple protocol. And it is expecting to talk to a proxy to be able to get out to the internet. Um, and so it won't have any fallbacks. Um, but with respect to my particular set of rules, uh, what I do with UDP is I say, look, I've got some name servers that need to be able to answer UDP questions um, that come in from the outside. So I permit that. So if it's going to that port, that server on port 53 or coming from that on port 53, it's permitted. Then I have some recursive servers who don't get questions from the outside, but they have to ask questions. So they also are allowed, if they're talking from that server to remote port 53 or getting an answer, that's allowed. So if what you want to do is bypass all of that, for example, if you have a Chromecast, it will use 8888 for its DNS, no matter what it got from DHCP. Um, so my solution was to simply give it an 8888 to talk to so that it would continue to work. Ask me after uh, after uh, after this is over if you want to hear what, what happened next. Um, but um, the uh, pretty much anything that tries to talk UDP port fifty three that is not one of the two things I just said I allow is default deny. So if you want to get DNS work done, you're going to talk to a DNS server that I told you you could reach, and so that that avoids the problem that you were just worried about. In the back. The like the Etsy hosts or the whatever hosts file in, in some directory and the deep directory in Windows, um, that is stateless because what you're doing there is you're causing the name to address lookup, which is a library function that's present in some form everywhere. You're causing that to return a value which is different from the truth. For example, you might say, yeah, if you're trying to get to doubleclick.net, their address is 127.002, uh, which is completely unreachable. And so you're just saying, I, that's a poor man's ad blocker. But what you're saying in that case is there shall be no TCP session or any other kind of session because you will not be able to find the right address. And that is fundamentally stateless. Because to be stateful in this context means that the gateway, the firewall, is aware of what flows are currently active and it's permitting things to be part of those flows. But if it's a new flow, then it has different rules. And so that statefulness is a recipe for, for failure. It's a recipe for pain and lost weekends. Um, so it's much better if you don't have to remember what you're currently allowing and why uh, because you're able to stop it from happening in the first place. And then anything that you didn't stop from happening is by default allowed to continue. Yes, sir. Do you have, is there like a timeline or a date of race for this for leadership and companies to be preparing? And you're going to get bombarded by vendors saying, hey, we're in this space, we're here to help you. Yes. Um, and to that extent, we should be thankful to the IAB for publishing RFC 8890. And so uh, I would say, look, this got published about eight years after Edward Snowden flew to Hong Kong. Uh, it has, it's starting to get traction. Uh, you should go to your next gen firewall vendor and say, look, what are you going to do about this? and wave that RFC, you will not be the first time that RFC has been waved at them, but they need to hear it. They need to hear that they're about to lose some of what made them competitively unique, which is the ability to look into a TLS session and decide whether it should or should not be allowed to start up. Visibility being passe and all. Am I out of time? Uh, very close. Yes. Yes, thank, thank you all for coming. <laughs>